Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Brow channel. This week we have yet another review for you, and this time it's Steampunk. As with my last two reviews, it is a series rather than just a single book. It seems to be more substantial. I kind of want to prove to you that I'm going through a lot of stuff. I'm reading and listening to a lot of books. One of the things I regret though is that none of the books in this particular series got into my top 10 steampunk novels list. That was because it tends not to show up on the top 10 lists that other people have been making. Why? I don't know. I can't fathom it. Uh, and in case, as I was doing my steampunk series novel, I thought, I remember this website that the authors set up a while back to you know, simulate a website for the organization from their books. And I thought it was clever. So I'll check those books out. I did, and I was hooked. The series in question is called The Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences. It's by Pip Ballantyne and T. Morris. So, regarding the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, it's one of those truisms, or one of those sad requirements for writers, is that you have to have comparisons. You have to do comparisons for your work. Even if your work is like the best thing ever, and, and is totally original, you have to say, it's like this and this. Because otherwise the agents and the publishers won't know what you're talking about. Well, in this case, the ministry is a lot like two different TV shows, which were among my favorites ever. The more recent one is The X-Files, <laughs> uh, of course, about the two FBI agents who investigated the paranormal. The other is from way back, from my childhood, it's called The Avengers, and this is not the Marvel Avengers. These are what I consider to be the real Avengers, <laughs> a couple of British secret agents, played by uh, Patrick Mee, I believe, and Diana Rigg. Anyway, that was one of my absolute favorite shows as a kid. So, these are the comps, and they are pretty good comps because the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences is a government agency of the British Empire, in this case, that investigates weird and paranormal type stuff. Now, the two protagonists are, as in those two series, it's a man and a woman. The protagonists in this series, that is the Ministry, are Eliza D. Braun, uh, who is a action girl. She's kind of a tough female character. She's a secret agent. She loves it. And she loves to blow stuff up with dynamite. She's also good with guns. She's a crack shot. And she carries these special pistols with her everywhere. They've got this, I don't know, some, some kind of uh, shell or something from New Zealand, uh, from her native New Zealand. The other character is Wellington Thornhill Books, and he is very stodgy Brit. And he likes to stay out of trouble. He's into intellectual pursuits. And he's the head archivist that is librarian at the ministry. <laughs> so it sounds pretty boring. Anyway, they, of course, are the archetypal odd couple. And circumstances throw them together. Now, it's interesting that this couple of writers did this. They are themselves a married couple. And uh, Pip Valentine, that is Philippa Valentine, is actually from New Zealand. So she has some knowledge of this for the character. So, as I was saying, Eliza D. Braun is quite a character. She's quite a um, kind of a troublemaker. And she's been banished from her native New Zealand for whatever reason. I actually don't recall if they ever said. <laughs> I was going back and looking at the previous books, trying to figure out why. Maybe they didn't. Anyway, the first book starts with the two of the meeting, and as usual, Eliza's getting into trouble. She is on a mission to actually eliminate him. <laughs> he has been abducted by the evil House of Usher. <laughs> you may recognize that name. In this book, it's a secret organization that wants to take over the world. And they have this base down in Antarctica where they're holding Mr. Books. Actually, what the ministry thinks uh, he thinks they think that he's gone over to the other side uh, because he was seduced by this uh, lovely little Italian 
assassin <laughs> and brought to the Antarctic base. And Eliza's supposed to kill him because he's going to give away secrets to them. Well, as it turns out, she has second thoughts and she decides to instead rescue him. Which is good because they discover that no, he was simply fooled and abducted and he went against his will and he didn't reveal anything that he could get away with. I, I believe they torture him, but you know, he stands up to it as much as he can. So they forgive him and they rescind the order to kill him, but at the same time they still demote her because she disobeyed orders. <laughs> And guess what they do with her? They send her to the archives. They make her Books' assistant, which is torture for her because she loves action. She loves being out in the field. She loves danger. She loves intrigue. And she loves blowing stuff up. It's, it's fun, but this is not fun. It's boring. Whereas Wellington, he, he loves his books. He loves organizing stuff, organizing artifacts and so on, and his analytical engine, which is a 19th century computer based on the real life a mechanical computer invented by Charles Babbage sometime around mid-1800s, I think. So they're very much of an odd couple. Now, of course, if it was going to stay this way, if they were just going to be in the archives for six books, it would be kind of boring. But Eliza is too stir-crazy. She can't handle this. And she starts looking at the cold cases and kind of connecting the dots. In fact, in one of the cold cases, she figures out that something that's happening currently may be connected. And she convinces Welly, as she calls him, to go out and do a little investigating on their own. <laughs> Unauthorized, because, you know, the ministry just isn't interested in this. And as it happens, they discover this evil society, the Phoenix Society, is up to no good. Of course, they get into trouble, but they also save the day, which keeps them from being kicked out completely, right? That is the first book, Phoenix Rising, published in 2011 by Harper Voyager. Now, there are five more books, and they each have some kind of a case, some kind of conspiracy, some kind of a danger that the two agents have to face. Uh, number one, of course, it's this evil Phoenix Society. What's also happening, the crime that's happening, is people are showing up dead in the streets of London, with their blood drained or their bones missing. Kind of creepy. Number two in the series is The Janus Affair, published 2012, also by Harper Voyager. In this case, people are vanishing again, but this time in bolts of lightning, and they particularly seem to be targeting suffragettes. Now, this is a cause that's near and dear to Eliza's heart, so she is especially interested in pursuing it. And she figures that the ministry isn't because they don't, you know, hold with this suffragette women's voting nonsense. Third book is Dawn's Early Light. From that phrase you might guess that they go to America and indeed they do. And they work with the American Office of the Supernatural and Metaphysical to deal with some attacks, mysterious attacks on airships and ships. And here we meet Nikola Tesla. <laughs> That's a requirement for steampunk you understand. And his rival Thomas Edison who ends up being a bit of a villain in some of these books. Fourth is The Diamond Conspiracy, uh, 2015, and this is by Ace Books. In this case, Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee is coming up, and it turns out that she's been compromised. Uh, Brooks and Braun discover this. She, the, she's being treated by this doctor with these longevity treatments. Turns out he's evil. He's the evil Dr. Henry Jekyll. <laughs> <laughs> and he's brought her under his sway. And so they have to save her, and they end up going to a lot of different places to, you know, piece together the case. Number five is The Ghost Rebellion, 2016. At this point, uh, Valentine and Morris lose their major publisher, and it's like total injustice of the way steampunk's been treated in the last few years. Nonetheless, they have their own outfit called Imagine That Studios, and so they have... Their, their series continuing, which is awesome. In this case, it goes to India. There are these nationalist rebels, some of which are known to be dead, <laughs> killed in this kind of battle between them and the British troops. Yet they're showing up, and they seem like ghosts. And so they're investigating, what in the heck's happening? How is this possible? Number six is Operation Endgame, 
which is a good name for the final book in the series. 2017 also imagined that studios, and this involves more of the evil genius Henry Jekyll. He's on a killing spree. He's murdering random innocent people, trying to lure Books and Brawn to a trap. They realize it's a trap, but they can't let him keep killing. And he is simultaneously working with the House of Usher in order to promote their sinister Operation Ragnarok. If you know anything about Norse mythology, you know it can't be good. That's the six books. They're not super long, but they're a fast read, well-paced. And Palantine and Morris also opened up their world to a number of other authors. So there are nine books of short stories published between 2011 and 2015 called Tales from the Archives. And these I haven't read. But it's kind of interesting, kind of fun that they do that. Uh, and finally, they have continued the series. Again, I haven't read any of them or listened to any of them. But it's a four-book series. Three have been published. The most recent one was published this very year, 2023, and it's called Verity Fitzroy and the Ministry Seven. Now, I will explain a little bit later who the Ministry Seven are. So let's go with the pros and cons, though, of this six-book series. Now, some of the people who reviewed it in Goodreads said, it's full of cliches and tropes, I hate that. They are wrong. Steampunk is all about tropes, and I love those tropes. I love them. And that's what makes it. That's what makes it so much fun. First of all, there's silly co covers with Eliza in sometimes impractically sexy outfits. <laughs> and they have the long chapter titles that tended to be in those Victorian era novels, such as In Which Our Colonial Pepper Pot, that's Eliza, uh, gets into trouble for this or that or whatever. But I, I love that kind of stuff. And they have the tech. They have the steampunk tech. They have airships, of course. Lightning guns. Bulletproof corsets. Hyper steam trains. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I assume they're fast. And they even have high-tech Star Trek-like transporters. Now, you may say, this is not Victorian, but it's been gotten from the Atlanteans. Yes, this is Atlantean tech that the Ministry has discovered and is exploiting, and is kind of keeping to itself. As steampunk is and should have, they have people from history as characters. In this case, Queen Victoria, her son, Prince Albert, uh, Nikola Tesla, and Thomas Edison, of course, as I mentioned, H.G. Wells, the writer, and the evil Henry Howard Holmes. He was a mass murderer, real life, uh, from the 1893 Chicago Columbian Expo Exposition. And he was running a hotel in which he would murder people <laughs> and do these experiments. He was kind of like Dr. Mengele, you know. He was actually hanged in real life, but in the novel he escapes the hangman's noose and starts conspiring with some of the other evil characters in the book. Uh, of course, they also have Victorian literary characters, including... Uh, Dr. Henry Jekyll from Robert Louis Stevenson's books. The House of Usher is from the books of Edgar Allan Poe. Changed it a little bit, but nonetheless, it's nice that it's familiar. And even uh, John Carter from Edgar Rice Burroughs. The Ministry Seven are also a literary illusion. They are a special version of Sherlock Holmes's Baker Street Irregulars. They are a bunch of street urchins who help Eliza in her cases. And they become more and more instrumental in the operations of the ministry as time goes on, eventually getting their own books. The characters are great. I love the characters. I, I love the colorful vi villains. We have like the maestro who wears a mask. He's like a supervillain. Uh, Diamond Dottie, who's this female uh, mafia donia, I guess you'd call her. Um, and there's, uh, of course, Dr. Henry Jekyll. And last but not least, the lovely and deadly Sofia del Morte, the Italian assassin, who loves to seduce men and then kill them. The agents are fun. We have uh, the bombastic uh, Basil Sound, who runs the ministry. He's the, the uh, basically the director. A couple other agents that pop up a lot are Bruce Campbell, the Australian, and Brandon Hill, the Canadian. So we have, you know, people from all parts of the empire, basically. 
and you have people from India and you know Maoris and so on showing up occasionally uh, to kind of add a little diversity but it's not overdone which is great there's excellent world building it's much like the real life 19th century Victorian times but with better tech and more intrigue the dialogue is fun a lot of witty banter and the humor especially I like Bruce Campbell the Australian now if you ever watched Monty Python, you know why his name has to be Bruce, because they're all named Bruce, right? <laughs> and he's kind of a buffoon. He is uh, the man with the ladies. <laughs> he loves the ladies, and he loves punching out bad guys, but he's too lazy to read a briefing. <laughs> so he gets himself into some trouble because he feels so underappreciated, blah, 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 of course. Now, the cons. I'm getting this it's kind of long, but this is a great series, so bear with me. This one I wasn't aware of, and I have to start this with an apology to Bonesart Vocal, who runs the Radio Retro Future channel. I reviewed his book, and I dinged him for the typos. Now, it turns out that there were people in Goodreads dinging Valentine and Morris for their typos, which I hadn't noticed because I had listened to these. They were identical sounding, but spelled wrong like uh, Bobble, B-O-B-B-L-E, instead of Bobble, B-A-U-B-L-E. Couldn't tell the difference when they were reading it. So I have to apologize to Bonsart. Yes, you needed a better editor, but so did these guys. <laughs> and they were working for a major publisher. There's no excuse for Harper Voyager not to have a better proofreader and for, to pay for it. Come on, guys. You can support your authors a little bit better than that, can't you? No wonder they're no longer with them. Uh, second thing. There's lots of exposition, maybe a little bit too much, a little bit more tell than show, especially in the first volume where you have to get things established. It's a, in a way, it's kind of a necessary evil in sci-fi of any sort. The relationship between books and brawn, it's a little bit anachronistic in the sense that, uh, yeah, they are kind of reserved the first couple books, but eventually they have a sexual relationship, which is kind of, you know, seems kind of, off with the Victorian times and people were so prudish. However, I know for a fact that there was a lot of stuff going on that you just didn't talk about. Like, for example, there were gay men's clubs in London. They just weren't advertised as such. And if, as long as they didn't, you know, get into too much, you know, public indecency, they were tolerated. And so, kind of like this. The only thing is I thought that once the ministry people realized that they're in this relationship, there would be some disapproval and there would also be a lot of kidding, a lot more kidding than there is. Uh, people have said, when are you guys getting married? When are you going to make her an honest woman? That kind of thing. So it's, it's funny uh, that, you know, in this time, you don't hear that. And the supernatural, it's interesting because you would expect that, but there really isn't much of that until much later in the game. Which to me was a little jarring. You know, suddenly you introduce ghosts in like the last book. When I... I had gotten to think that all of the peculiar occurrences were just technology that we didn't understand. You know, like Arthur C. Clarke would say, indistinguishable from magic. And there were times when there was cameos that just appeared briefly to introduce a character that didn't last long enough or in integrate well enough into the story. That's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Finally, I have to address the audiobook narration. <laughs> it's really good in the fourth one and I assume it probably is fine with the first three as well even though I didn't get the audiobooks for those James Langton you know professional very good job when they lost their contract or their their relationship with Ace and Har Harper Voyager uh, Valentine and Morris did their own narration now that is harder than it seems as you can tell by all my mistakes and, and gaffes when I'm doing these things. There's only one author that should read his own books, and that's Neil Gaiman, because he's a genius. But other than that, you know, they do their best, but in book five, they alternate chapters, and especially T struggles with it. Sometimes it's hard to understand him. Uh, Pip is better. She had this nice New Zealand accent. It's very pleasing, but she sometimes mispronounces words, etc. Book six is just her, which was a good choice. Which was definitely a good choice, but even she sometimes has a little trouble with some of the male voices. You know, when the woman tries to make her voice deep, sometimes it sounds a little silly. It's 
a veteran voice actor who can do this correctly. Another minor, minor complaint. Anyway, all these pros versus cons, you would think I might rate it under five, but I'm not going to. I'm going to rate it five out of five gears. That is the entire series because it's just so darn good and it's so darn gripping and the pacing is wonderful and the action is great and the characters are fun. I mean, I just look over all those errors, those problems, and I just say, heck with it. <laughs> they don't matter. I highly, highly recommend this to anybody who loves steampunk. And, you know, the people who complained the most on Goodreads were just idiots. <laughs> no, actually, just all kidding aside, the people who complained the most were people who didn't like steampunk. If you don't like steampunk, you won't like this. I mean, steampunk is fun and silly. That's the, the whole point. I mean, that's part of what it's about. If you don't like that, then you shouldn't be reading it. And so there. Anyway, this has been my review of The Mystery of Peculiar Occurrences by the awesome and great T. Morris and Pip Ballantyne. Kudos to them, and especially for their productivity and for all the stuff they continue to produce. Huzzah! And one more thing I have to say, besides please leave your comments below, is that Mrs. Desperado told me that I am not promoting our books and I need to be doing that. And she is correct. She's absolutely correct as she often is, uh, I just, you know, I got a little tired of it because I haven't gotten out my new book yet, Hunter's Wager, and I was planning to do some big promotion then. But, I must say, um, we do have um, three novels out that are steampunk. Some of these novels, the Fidelio's Automata novel, and it's got an associated short story, and there's a sequel for that that I'm going to write sometime. I did start it, and uh, the Professor Ion D series, where she is a female genius adventurer. And that one, I'm actually working on the third one for that. So look for that soon. Probably not till the beginning of next year, unfortunately. So, as I said, this has been my review. Please like and subscribe, because that helps us get out the good steampunk gospel. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.